to say anything else, I've been asked to give a special welcome to Raquel Nagrayo, who is from the Brazilian Workers' Party. So, so very, very warm welcome to you, Raquel. I was trying to see. Uh, hi, yes, I can Thank see you. you. Hi. I'm really pleased you could join us. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm welcome. just here like two years ago in the UK, so I'll try to follow. <laughs> That's, that's fantastic you could come. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. You certainly are, and a big welcome to everybody else who's come. So um, so th th this evening, so I'm just going to go back to the notes. <clears throat> Give us a moment. We, we seem to stand on sort of pinnacle regarding the Labour Party. We've had this meteoric rise onto Jeremy Corbyn and the, the kind of the uniting of all sorts of shades of left opinion under this one umbrella. Uh, since then, there's been a systematic attack within and without the party to destroy democracy in, in the Labour Party and to undo all the things that, um, uh, that Jeremy brought in. So we've seen systematic attack after systematic attack. Where's my list? There we are. <laughs> so we've had, we've had the, leak, the leak report. We've had the uh, sackings of the shadow cabinet. Corbyn's been suspended. And then now loads of people are leaving the Labour Party. Uh, so the question now is, is that the right thing to do or not? People are starting up new groups. Other people are, are determined to stay in the Labour Party. And for some of us, it's uh, staying and fights if you can. Um, so Carol, Carol's going to lead off this evening. I don't know how long you, you want, Carol. Do you want me to time you? Um, yeah, so it's about 10 minutes because I'm just doing like an introduction to... All right. Tonight, Pam. I so apologise if I've done it for you. <laughs> You'll do right, it. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll give you some quarter past, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, you thanks, Carol. You tell me when to shut up. Um, yeah. Right, well, thank you very much and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Carol Buxton, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I'm the chair of West Ham Labour Party. Um, we've got about two and a half thousand members in our Labour Party, which is quite. Um, a big number for um, a small geographical area. And the West Ham is very significant to the Labour movement. Um, and that's because of Keir Hardy. Um, he was the first Labour MP and a founder member of the Labour Party. Um, and he's, you know, e even though a lot of people around here may not know a lot about history, that people have heard of Keir Hardy. Um, he was an ordinary working man and his history is fascinating. He actually left school when he was seven and by the age of 10 was working in a coal mine. Um, and he wore a cloth cap in Parliament. He didn't wear the top hat. He wore a cloth cap and he was vilified in the press for doing so. Contrast that to another Keir, Sir Keir Starmer elected leader of the Labour Party in 2020, privately educated, went to Oxford, peer of the realm, um, became the um, director of public prosecutions um, and has only actually been an MP since 2015. And he was elected this year on a unity ticket. He said he was going, he was a socialist, he wanted to unite all um, parts of the Labour Party. And of course, the story has been the exact opposite of that in reality. So the Labour Party was born with a Kia. And the question is, will it die with a Kia? And I believe that's going to be the case. So I want to just say something about being in the Labour Party and what it's been like for those of you who are not in the, the, in the British Labour Party. Um, it's always been very frustrating. Um, and as Pam indicated, it has been a bit of a, a roller coaster. Um, and really over the past four years or so, it has been a constant war between the left and the right. And in all honesty, um, you know, when Jeremy became the leader, almost by mistake, actually, um, you remember the right wing thought they'd let him on the ticket. 
uh, just to show the left how rubbish the left were and they wouldn't get anywhere. Well, and then he became the leader. Um, and the membership just exploded. I can remember um, one of the first meetings, big public meetings that Corbyn called in uh, Islington. Uh, I turned up two hours beforehand, which is very unusual for me because I'm not known for my punctuality. But I knew there was going to be a lot of people there. And actually, uh, the queues, I, I just, in the end, I just went home because the queues were so huge. There were thousands of people there, literally thousands, inspired by the thought of a socialist as leader of the Labour Party. And the membership was composed of lots and lots of youth and of older people like myself who felt, oh my God, there's a chance in the Labour Party for some socialist ideas. And of course, the roller coaster goes down as well as up. And there were huge political failures. Um, a failure to tackle and re-institute re some sort of democracy in the Labour Party, particularly around the reselection of our MPs. Um, and then uh, Pam mentioned the leaked report, which showed the Labour Party staffers who had blocked Corbyn, blocked the leader's office. Ah, uh, right, okay. <laughs> had um sorry can't hear you pam shall i just carry on yeah okay um i just you know, said with, everybody mute if that's not speaking please thank you thanks um yeah the leaked report really exposed um the party officials of which there are about 420 of them um with, and that grew that grew really as the labor party grew that the number of staffers grew hugely um, and you know they they behaved in an appalling way blocking uh, Corbyn blocking the socialist policies uh, act, acting in the most undemocratic way presiding over suspensions stopping their own people being suspended not investigating complaints they didn't like the look of there was huge capitulation to the parliamentary Labour Party. You know, it's like, um, it, it's like a triangle. The pimple at the top seems to be absolutely able to get away with anything they want. And so you had MPs like Jess Phillips, who said they weren't just going to, they wouldn't stab Corbyn in the back. They'd stab him in the front. Um, Nothing happened. They could get away with doing all of this. You could stand in Parliament evidently and shout in Jeremy Corbyn's face, calling him, calling him a effing anti-Semite, and nothing would happen to you. And a lot of very good socialists, including very high, high profile names, people like um, Chris Williamson, Jackie Walker, Mark Wadsworth, which is most probably in my book, the worst example, of throwing your friends to the wolves. Um, now Sir Keir, and I always call him that, I don't call him Keir Starmer, I want everyone to remember that he's a peer of the realm, um, that Sir Keir, now his leader, is presiding over the right wing's claim to get their party back. And we're now in the midst of a purge of the left. And Jeremy Corbyn was suspended for saying, well, for telling the truth. A bizarre old world where you tell the truth and you get punished, but you stand and tell lies and you get rewarded. So he basically, he said that following the report by the um, Equalities and Human Rights Commission a week or so ago, he said that reports of the number of cases of anti-Semitism were hugely exaggerated. And um, it shows you how confident the right wing have been and are in purging us. There's a real witch hunt going on now. I'm gonna be very 
careful with using that term. I use it deliberately because it is a witch hunt and it must have felt like this in McCarthy times in America. Um, recently, in a report, I was accused of anti-Semitism, um, a report carried out um, locally uh, into, Labour Party, into the Labour Party. I, it, what I had done was I had liked a Facebook comment that protested against the what I was called the witch hunt against Chris Williamson in the Labour Party. Because they used the term witch hunt, that was considered an anti-Semitic trope. This is how bizarre it has become. Um, and I've written down what the report said. Um, Anti-Semitism uh, in this Facebook uh, quote is seen in its in, as entirely invented by Jewish critics for a dishonest ulterior motive. That relates to claims that women were witches and that is also a claim that has an ulterior motive and is untrue. I mean, can you believe how tenuous the link is and how ridiculous it has become? But this witch hunt is unlike previous witch hunts. It really is much more vicious um, and based on spurious grounds, as some people in the audience this evening will know because they will have been themselves suspended or expelled from the Labour Party. We are told what to talk about now. That's also something that has changed quite dramatically. Um, Bristol North East um, had a, a resolution uh, that, suspend, that supported um, the reinstatement of Jeremy Corbyn and for that on Thursday, I believe it was, they were suspended. The chair and the secretary were suspended. Um, and then lo their comrades locally set up a hashtag saying, sack the regional director. And for that, they've been suspended too, um, but for bullying this time. <laughs> so Bristol South followed suit. Uh, they wanted to give £3,000 to uh, the local food bank charity and to Acorn, which is, um, I think, a renter's charity, renter's union, and they were blocked by the same regional commissioner. So if we stand up, what I'm trying to say is if we stand up, we're going to be cut down. That's the reality of the Labour Party. There's also a huge dribbling away, and the NEC elections showed this. Um, also, I should actually say at this point, congratulations to Roger, who did extraordinarily well in the NEC election. Um, he didn't win, but he, he came very high up on, in the voting. So congratulations to you, Roger, because you've used that as a brilliant platform. Carol, but, Carol you've had 15 minutes. Right, can I, I'll just sum up then and just yep. say that there's a lot of dribbling away. The NEC elections actually were really interesting because it showed you how many members there were in February and how many members are now and we're down 60,000 almost 60,000 members and um, you know when you if you give up your membership of the Labour Party and give up your um, paying paying in your subs as it were you normally have a six month leeway so it, that figure is likely to be much much higher um, you know it, given when we come to the new year so I just really like to remind everybody that I said at the beginning about the youth, the way the, num the hundreds of thousands of young people came into the Labour Party because of Corbyn and the, uh, and the, and the, the prospect of uh, a, a new way of, of living, of, a, of, of getting back for university, um, better housing, all of those promises that we had, the promise of Corbyn, and now in London, during the NEC election, in London, the total youth vote was 1,660. That's how far it's fallen. But we have to remember that the Labour movement is more than the Labour Party. It's the trade union movement. So, I mean, I'm not prepared to put my neck on the, uh, write a suicide note and let David Evans, the, the General Secretary, um, 
expel me because I think Jeremy Corbyn should be back in the Labour Party. We're going to put motions through our trade unions and our trades council. But the most important thing that we do locally in our area is get involved in grassroots campaigns. We're involved in, you know, a huge number of us in campaigns around housing, against development and gentrification, in support of um, immigrants, in support of schools, um, fighting against academisation and against cuts. And we know that in our area, Brexit, in an area where there's huge poverty already, that Brexit is going to be really, really hard for us and hurt us. So we're going to, we are in an unprecedented economic downturn and we know that the working class are going to move. They're going to move forward. We don't know what is going to be over. We don't, don't know what form it's going to take, but we do know that capitalism is failing humanity. The Labour Party, with its move to the centre, has no solutions for us. So I believe a split is coming. What it looks like and on what basis, what the scenario is going to be, I'd like to leave that to discussion and to hear views of all the comrades here, particularly comrades who are in other countries, who have a different sort of experience and how our new Labour Party, Socialist Labour Party can be formed. Okay, thank you comrades. Thanks, Carell. I think that's a really excellent in introduction. Um, I think I think there's probably <coughs> excuse me a lot of experiences to be shared here. Uh, I'd like to invite people to come in. You don't have to make a five minute speech. You can make a remark, and you can ask a question. So I'm hoping that the conversation will flow fairly fluidly rather than to, you know long speeches all the time. So that, that's my suggestion for this evening's format. Would anybody like to kick off? You just put your, if you all know how to do it, if you put your hand up in the uh, participant box and I'll spot you. Nobody yet. Does anybody want to ask Carell a question? Or does anybody want to ask anybody a question? Uh, Roger, I think you've got, I think that was your hand, was that your hand going up then? No? It was tentatively, I wanted to come in a bit later, but I do I do want to speak at some point. Okay. But if, if nobody else wants to, I'll speak now. But... Nobody's indicating at the moment, so you go ahead. Um, okay, well, um, first of all, as uh, comrades in Britain would know, I, ha I did stand for the um, election to the NEC. Um, I did that. I was standing not just against the right wing, but I'm afraid against the left as well, against the official left, the so-called grassroots voice, which had, um, I'm afraid I can only say, six things up. They didn't allow, uh, they decided at a meeting, a slate, a private meeting where they excluded um, the what is at least the second biggest of the left groups within the Labour Party, which was the Labour Left Alliance, of which I'm a member. And uh, anyway, it meant that um, I was battling, uh, battling more or less on my own, me and the other comrades of the Labour Left Alliance, one of whom is here, by the way, Carol Taylor Spedding. Uh, and um, I think we did extraordinarily well in the circumstances. As far as I'm concerned, um, I got, um, it was a single transferable vote, which was a bit complicated, but it meant it went to 37 rounds, and I got as far as round 30, uh, which is a lot further than I expected. I, um, I did, um, I won nominations from 65 constituency Labour parties, uh, I got a total of 3,473 uh, votes, but even better than that, 2,072 of those were first preference votes. So, and that was on the basis of standing 
uh, on a um, full-blooded socialist um, program. So I'm, I'm very happy about the results, especially also um, when you take into account that there were 6,000 votes that were annulled uh, and they were they would overwhelmingly, if not, if not unanimously, have been left votes because there were people who um, resigned in protest at the suspension of Jeremy uh, Corbyn. And I mean, it's, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not going to do a Trump. I'm not going to say that this is uh, electoral fraud and that uh, it's fake news, although I'm tempted to. But, uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, I'm, well, I think, I think um, in the circumstances, it's not, it's not a question of personal pride. I'm proud on behalf of the fact that there is a proper um, heartbeat of a socialist tradition still there in the Labour Party, and it made itself felt um, despite all the obstacles. Now, what I want to say, though, is something about, you know, what um, Carell said about talking about the current um, witch hunt. So I do think the word witch hunt maybe is sometimes abused a bit. I think it was perhaps a little bit overstated uh, when there was a, a mass purge of members uh, from the Labour Party in the 1980s and 90s, um, which was um, when people were being, were being expelled, but, but they were being expelled for being Marxists, for being, um, for, for being Trotskyists, or for, being, for organizing as a tendency within the Labour Party. And it was, it was deemed to be um, unconstitutional to organize, which is of course completely uh, false and completely hypocritical. The right wing organizes, uh, but, the, but the, uh, you know, there is a long tradition of, um, of left wingers who've been expelled from the, from the Labour Party. Stafford Cripps was expelled and he later um, became um, Chancellor in a Labour government. Michael Foote was expelled and he later became leader of the Labour Party. My Bevan was expelled at a certain mm -hmm. time. And um, uh, my own father, who was uh, left Labour MP for 33 years, on two occasions was um, uh, had the whip withdrawn, and others was expelled from the Parliamentary Labour Party, and so on. I mean, there's a long tradition of lefts who've been victimised simply for putting forward um, left oppositional views within the party. But this, the reason why this is so much more disgusting and so much more outrageous is that to accuse socialists of being racist is about the most vile insults that could possibly be made. And there is absolutely no grounds whatsoever for it. And it's a witch hunt exactly in the same way that the original witch hunts were. The, the, uh, the hunts of, um, of um, women in the, um, in the 16th and 17th centuries for being witches. So it was completely false allegations and uh, where there was no right of appeal, if you like. There was no right of... Um, uh, no, no means to defend oneself. One was once one's accused of it, and one's already um, condemned for it. And that's that's what has happened with uh, huge numbers of genuine um, socialists. The way be there have been maybe there might be some some people who are anti-Semitic in the lower party, but but to to um, most of the people who this accusation has been hurled at, uh, it's been absolutely a travesty and absolutely uh, outrageous. So why is it, I mean, uh, the, the, this uh, witch hunt is so much different, if you like. Um, I think it's because um, at that time, there was a movement against the left because, uh, you know, they had the, uh, the, the brief uh, leadership that was held briefly by uh, Michael Foote and the right wing wanted to reassert itself. And so they started a whole process. But it took some 10 years before it, before it reached... Um, uh, the the stage of um, of the new Labour take takeover. A new Labour was, I would say, a completely alien takeover by the party. It was um, it, it uh, removed the socialist clause from the Labour Party constitution, clause four. It completely altered the whole structure of the conference and all the rest of it. Um, and it was accompanied, as I say, by a vicious uh, campaign to expel uh, left wingers and all the rest of it. But, never, but, but now what we're seeing is the same process, but carried through 
at a breakneck speed. It's like a bit like a kind of Keystone Cop silent movie. It's just uh, the most wildest, the most ludicrous smears of racism. And um, I think the reason for that difference is because Blairism <coughs> had a certain, it, it, it was able to, it, it had a certain success because there was, um, it was against the background of, of um, a, a, an upswing in the economy and a boom. It was possible under the, under the new Labour government, although it was, uh, in many ways, it was continuing the policies of Thatcher, but under a different name. But I think the, the difference is that um, um, it was able to introduce reforms at the same time. For instance, uh, the minimum wage, for instance, uh, 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 although, although on a privatised basis, but an investment in the infrastructure. Uh, the um, Good Friday Agreement, which made concessions to Irish um, nationalism and so on. But today, we're having the same process, speeded up and gone to the most grotesque and bizarre kind of uh, lengths, but against the background of what, what is looming ahead as the biggest slump in history. When, when serious uh, bankers and capitalist commentators and economists are saying not that just that it'll be as bad as the 1930s, but they're saying it'll be as bad as the slump of 1709, believe it or not. And with the looming trade war, and maybe even uh, spilling over into hot wars here and there. And with uh, not just this pandemic, but the likelihood of new pandemics and maybe even more deadly pandemics coming on the basis of the um, uh, agribusinesses which are um, eroding the natural habitats. And, and uh, well, well, we've explained all this, we discussed this at previous meetings. And of course, with climate change, with the catastrophes of kind of horror film dimensions, and even the talking seriously and soberly of the threat of human extinction. And at the same time as well, with the sharpest kind of polarization in uh, social struggles and class struggles, with vicious authoritarian regimes springing up around the world, but also simultaneously with uprisings worldwide, something again we focused a lot of attention on, whether in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, in Belarus, and so on. So in this context, what hope is there for a Blairite so-called middle way? Um, I would say none whatsoever. And that's why I agree with what Carell was saying, that uh, the likelihood is that the Labour Party will split on that basis. And I just want to say one thing about that, though, because there are many people talking now about, oh, well, I mean, as I've already said, there were 6,000 people who resigned from the Labour Party, probably a lot more than that or who've let their membership lapse. Then there are also, there are, there are people who've been suspended or expelled and um, who are talking about, well, we need to create a new party. Well, I just think it's important to sound a note of warning about that. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going on too long. I just want to make, make um, one serious point about this, which I think is um, very relevant at the, at the present time. There are many people talking now, well, we need a new party. What's the point of saying in Labour? Well, first of all, I would say that the, the best riposte to a um, leadership which is, which is trying to get rid of the left, one by expelling people, but also in the hope of demoralizing thousands more and making them leave voluntarily, that the thing to do is say, well, they want, they, want, they want us out of the Labour Party, right, I'm leaving. That is not a rational response. It, is not, it, it doesn't uh, make sense. But when we talk also, when we see also the history History of the last um, uh, 80 years is littered with left groups that tried to leave the Labour Party and fizzled up, fizzled out into nothing at all. In, um, in 1931, the ILP uh, left the Labour Party. That was, that had a, a you know, an a irreplaceable um, place in the traditions of the Labour movement. It predated the Labour Party. It was the first uh, Labour organisation, Labour political organisation in Britain. Uh, they, they had 16,000 members when they left and very, very quickly they fizzled out into, into a sect. Uh, more recently, we had Arthur Scargill tried to create a, a breakaway from the Labour Party in the mid-90s. And he was somebody who led the biggest industrial uh, strike in British history for 60 years. 
And he, again, his party, nevertheless, despite his um, charisma, uh, it fizzled out very, very quickly. It never, it never took off at, at all. We've had um, more recently, George Galloway tried. Now he's somebody, whatever you think about him, but he did win <clears throat> a by-election against Labour uh, by a huge majority. Um, now in this situation, you see people, people who had real public uh, persona and a uh, real basis of support. When they left, if, because they didn't leave on clear issues and because they weren't, because they, um, because it wasn't based on a mass um, um, upheaval within within the party and the trade union, there won't be long, I promise. Uh, they en ended up with nothing. So, for instance, now we recently Chris Williamson, who's somebody I like and admire very much, but he's talked about creating a new party, and I believe he's linked up with another failed breakaway party called the TUSC. But I mean, it's it's really it's impossible to imagine that um, that uh, that could could actually become a mass party to rival the Labour Party. But what will what will happen is when millions of people, at least hundreds of thousands of people, move into action because they're because of uh, events in society. There won't be a split because Jeremy Corbyn was suspended, just as there wasn't a split when the five ILP MPs had a dispute with the Parliamentary Labour Party on an obscure issue about um, standing orders in Parliament. It would, it would come because of mass unemployment, the kind of things we're talking about, mass unemployment, starvation wages, the, uh, the fact that youth are doomed and have got no future, no, no hope in the, under the present circumstances, the, uh, the uh, brutal attacks by, by the state and by the police. Those are the kind of issues which could create mass movements and which could lead to splits. The, um, it's already happened um, even um, uh, fairly recently, within living memory, if you like, that the RMT, the Rail U Union, and the Fire Brigades Union both uh, left the Labour Party in, um, in the 90s. Um, the uh, Len McCluskey of the biggest union, Unite, threatened to create a new party as, uh, as recently as 2015. He said that uh, if the Labour Party doesn't, doesn't honour its commitment to the unions, to the trade unions and the rights of workers, then uh, they'd create a new party in opposition. And that could happen. And that, I think, is the way that things will develop. We have to stay firm. We have to keep our place and keep battling on. It's not the first defeat the left has, has suffered, it's uh, only the latest. And uh, we have to stand firm, put up our uh, policies, put our point of view, maintain links with people who left or been suspended um, so that they're not just lost to history and to the movement. But I do think that we, um, that Carell is right to look to, look to a future and uh, maybe not in the very distant future of a mass split and the creation of, of a um, new um, trade union based party which will be um, which will meet the needs of the youth and of uh, the um, uh, um, zero hours workers and all the people in society who are crying out for some kind of political lead thank you thanks roger i'm sure there'll be time for you to come back in later <laughs> Anybody else want to come in at the moment? Otherwise, I was going to say something. Oh, hang on. John and Dominic, you come in next, please. Or whichever one it is got your hand up. Do you know how to unmute yourself? Yeah, sorry about I can't stick the hand up electronically because it's a borrowed iPad and I don't know how to work it. I'll show you sometime. <laughs> well, after yeah. lock. Okay. After um, lock, yeah. um, it, well, comrades, it's partly to follow on from what Roger's just said. The way my thoughts are going is this, that my brother and myself wrote a letter to Sir Keir Starmer shortly after he became leader because of what we considered his lacklustre approach to the present crisis, to the pandemic, and also to the um, economic developments that would flow from the pandemic, i.e. mass unemployment. And we said that we thought he was really lackadaisical in his approach. And that has been my feeling. The media and commentators on politics talk about Sir Keir Starmer being clinical and incisive in his parliamentary 
um, you know, sort of dealings with Boris Johnson. I see him in anything but those terms. As far as I'm concerned, I think the big, uh, if you like, test will come when the Tories present a budget that will stem from, you know, the, the situation we're in now. And given the history of the Parliamentary Labour Party over the last five to six years, <clears throat> and given Keir Starmer's <clears throat> present political stance, I see that the Parliamentary Labour Party, in one form or another, will probably opt for an abstention on that budget. Austerity budget. And that, that budget will be severe austerity. Boris Johnson indicated some three or four months ago that there would be a big review of the care system and the fact that carers were, if you like, totally underappreciated uh, with zero hours contracts with minimum wage, etc., and yet they were in the firing line. They were the ones in the care homes or doing, if you like, home health care who were facing some of the worst sort of conditions. They were facing, in many cases, severe illness and deaths. And he's done absolutely nothing about that. All the talk a few months ago was we're never going back to the old norm the old normal, that people who were valued, i.e. shop workers who were maintaining things, that a lot of the gig economy that were maintaining things and the care workers. And as far as I'm concerned, I think that's when the big, if you like, upheavals will come within the Labour Party. Because <clears throat> if you like, when it comes to big business, they will be talking about the need for investment and the need for big business to have capital and therefore Boris Johnson in the past has indicated that he sees the way forward as tax cuts for the rich. So from that point of view, while there may be thousands of people leaving the Labour Party, there are still tens of thousands remaining in it and unfortunately, because of lockdowns, because of the pandemic, if you like, the normal activity and meetings in the Labour Party are not taking place. Once we get back to some sort of normality through, say, a vaccine or what have you, things begin to ease up, people begin to meet. That's when, if you like, the debates and the discussions will take place. I think myself, as far as the smears and the expulsions for so-called racism come, I look at my own area and the only person that I've ever come across that was seriously described as an anti-Semite was Sir Gerald Kaufman. Now Gerald Kaufman went back, what, 50, 60 years in the party. Many of his family died in Auschwitz and his he was a Jew, and his big crime was the fact that he took on the Israeli government and its disgusting treatment of the Palestinian people. And he said he was spat on in the synagogue, he was criticised in the Jewish Chronicle, and quite frankly, I think as far as all this anti-Semitism is concerned, much of it is the criticism of the Israeli government's treatment of the Palestinian people. So I'll just leave it at that. But I think the next budget is going to be the crunch because I think it will be an austerity budget and I don't think Keir Starmer will be and the Parliamentary Labour Party will take it on. And I'll just l literally finish on this one. Why the hell they had to change the slogan for the many, not the few, and come in with under new leadership sounds like as though They've taken over a failed second-hand shop. And they will leave it at that, comrades. Thanks, John. Um, Carol Taylor Spenning, I think you were next. Thank you, Pam. Um, 
a couple of points. Uh, I was quite disturbed to see that only, I think, 27% of the Labour Party actually voted in the NEC elections. You know, that to me, that smacks of uh, dis, 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 being disenfranchised, feeling, I think a lot of left-wing members have felt, well, this is ridiculous. We've had the leaked Labour report and no action done on it. We've got people being uh, suspended or expelled left, right and centre for absolutely nothing. And it seems to me that uh, the, the right, the, the traitors and the right-wing cabal at the, at the centre of the Labour Party are totally in control. David Evans is strangling all uh, discourse, all debate, and trying to shut down all debate in the Labour Party. I don't see how we can come back from this. I, I'm, I'm fairly new to this, so I haven't lived through this before, which I know many of you will have done uh, when you know Blair and New Labour were in power. But, I mean, to, to, if, if, if the Labour Party is in such a state that thousands of people voted for Luke Akehurst, then, goodness gracious me, you know, where are we going? Where are we going with this? Um, I find that absolutely shocking that I'm in a party now that can actually think that Luke Akehurst represents uh, the workers, represents the Labour Party. Uh, I just find that absolutely shocking. Now, Roger's mentioning a big split um, but at the moment, all that's happening is people are being picked off one by one. Starmer is uh, uh, a member of the Trilateral Commission, the only MP who is. Um, they are firmly against democracy. They want schools and, ed and universities to produce compliant, uh, biddable uh, young people. Uh, it's a really suspect organisation. Uh, as far as I can see, all he's done is proved to the establishment that he's a safe pair of hands to take over when they finally get rid of finally get rid of Lia Johnson because obviously his things are not going too well there. So I just see uh, Starmer as as coming in, parachuted in to to take hold of the Labour Party, get rid of the socialists, get rid of the left, uh, and now he's he's he started with Jeremy Corbyn and loads and loads of others. So I just I am very disheartened about what is going on and I can understand how many left-wing members are now leaving the party because it just does not with, with Starmer in charge it just it is not representing what we believe and he is strangling he is suspending and strangling any debate through David Evans any debate on on these issues if you speak up and speak out against the witch hunt, against all this ridiculous, ridiculous things that we've heard uh, about people, the ridiculous charges that are being brought against them. And if you say so, then you're immediately suspended. It seems to me that the right wing and the establishment, through Keir Starmer, have got an absolute vice-like grip on the Labour Party at the moment. And I'd like to know how on earth this grip is going to be released and how we're going to release... Uh, the left wing, the socialism, back into the party. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carol. We have got three people waiting. Oh, one of comrades would mind if I spoke next because this is obviously relevant to what we're talking about. Is that is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as comrades probably know, I'm now a total. I'm a, a sole responsible. I now hold sole responsibility for uh, bringing the Labour Party into dispute with my. At my anti Semitism, as explained in the EHRC report, which is an absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous. I, I don't know how they've got away with putting it in because it doesn't make it's absolutely logical, it doesn't make any sense. And the examples that are given are not anti Semitism, the only sense it's a reference to anti Semitism are the ones they put in. But uh, th this is how, as, as an old Labour Party member, I've Five years ago, I agreed to have my name put on a ballot paper in what I thought was a Tory ward, and I wouldn't, I really didn't expect to get elected. Um, and I only put my name forward because of Jeremy Corbyn, I wouldn't have dreamed of it otherwise. So I then did get elected, and as comrades may or may not know, I've been absolutely bullied and harangued by the Labour Party for the whole of the, almost the whole of the time I was in that, in that position. I was uh, suspended and uh, investigated and reinstated once uh, and then so not very long after was suspended and then fast tracked out of the Labour Party on basically on remarks they were not anti-Semitic um, 
But one thing I did just, I, I, I actually, I'm actually taking legal action against the AHRC now, and I was asked to dig out all the paperwork from the investigation. Um, one of the one of the um, things that appears in the investigation, I've made a, I'm discussing Marxism, and it appears in an investigation. I have to explain myself, and I think that's an example of what they're really driving at. They want to crush all free speech, so that and, and frighten people into saying nothing. Uh, I, I'm not prepared to let that happen, but I think it's worth mentioning that absolute vicious campaign I've had against me is it's absolutely appalling. It's shocking. <laughs> and I'm, I'm only one of many Labour Party members in, in that position. Nonetheless, I would still rejoin the Labour Party if I could. I absolutely, I, I absolutely think I have a right to be a member. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I have any success in this court case, I shall be applying to rejoin. <laughs> well, that's all I want to say, say now. So um, shall we move on to um, Thin Bar? Can't hear you, Finn. Can, turn your sound on. Unmute yourself, Finn. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a matter for the members of the British Labour Party to decide what's the best policy to pursue. And it's very interesting to listen to the experiences of the comrades who have spoken when they talk about the indignities they've had to endure in the Labour Party. I was a member of the British Labour Party for a few years, the same branch that Roger was in, in Barnes Court in West London, now I live in Dublin, and I'm a member of the Irish Labour Party. But I want to raise a matter of an international uh, nature. The big advantage the Kermits have with regards to the British Labour Party is this. The British Labour Party exists. The Italian Socialist Party is gone off the agenda, even though its founders were Marxists. The Greek Pasok Party is gone. The French Socialist Party, after Hollande's government, has been totally discredited and is struggling to be relevant in society at all. The German SPD, all the parties I refer to are all members of the same organisation as the British Labour Party. The German SPD has been so discredited in its coalition governments with Angela Merkel that its future is hard uh, to predict. The Spanish Socialist Party, the PSOE, again with a Marxist tradition and a Marxist background, is struggling to be relevant, even though they're in government uh, in Spain. In Ireland, the Irish Labour Party, in the most recent opinion poll, got 4%. That's more or less a large bus queue on Saturday afternoon. Like 4% for a national party founded by Connolly, James Connolly, in 1912. So when I say the British Labour Party has at least the advantage of existing, that's a relevant point to make. And the British Labour Party is not just based on the Trajan movement, its foundation is also in the cooperative movement, in mass, uh, various mass uh, organisations from time to time, such as the Indian uh, Workers' Party movement was also in the British Labour Party. So it's got these traditions and roots, and there's also the possibility of a Labour government. Now, we talk about the splits and so on, that's, uh, these points are very relevant for the British comrades, but I'm raising these points of a more general nature, because at least you have the advantage of a party that can struggle to form a government, a party still with roots in the movement, and a party that won't disappear. Unlike internationally, there's so many parties which were founded around the um, beginning of the last century who no longer are relevant or even exist. Now, I'm raising that from an international point of view because it's important to consider that the things that are happening in Britain, the attack on the left, was also part of the other parties across Europe as well. The expulsions, the disqualifications, all these issues, the lack of democracy and control by the national bureaucracy have affected all the parties of the old Second International, or as, as it's now called, the Source International, and what it's now called in Europe is the Alliance for Progressives and so on, which is a ridiculous name for socialist movement, but they're all in that same organisation and the flaws and the uh, problems that have been pointed out by the Congress here exist in all of these parties. So I'm only raising this point just uh, not to give any advice to anybody, it's not for me to decide what needs to be done, but just to show that what's happening in Britain is not unique and what decisions you make in Britain with regard to the activities of the left in the British Labour Party have implications right across Europe. And I conclude on the point I began with, 
the main advantage that the British Labour Party has over our party in Ireland, or the Italian party, or other parties of or the French Socialist Party, is that it exists and that it's relevant in the minds of the workers in Britain. Be that critical or not, it does exist. So I'm going to raise that point to give an international kind of flavour to the general discussion, which is very interesting and very useful and very informative. Thank you, comrades. Thanks, Finn. Thanks very much, Finn. I, th I think it's uh, very, very useful, actually, to have comrades from outside the UK coming in and giving us their impression of what's going on. I think that's actually very, very valuable. So please, you know, if, you, if you, you're not a UK resident, if you're joining us from abroad, please no, don't hesitate to come in and say, you know, what your impressions are of what's going on. But having said that, we've got Themos next. Would you like to come in, Themos? Yes, thank you. Uh... Well, I am very hesitant in commenting on what's happening elsewhere, especially in Britain. And uh, I, 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 I'm encouraged by the latest uh, uh, speaker, uh, Finbar, uh, talking about the international aspect of all this, because it, it's true that it's, it, it's not something unique that is happening in, uh, in Britain. We have lived through it in many countries. And, Certainly, Cyprus we did in, in a in a in a very in a different sort of uh, uh, way, but uh, essentially it's the same thing. Uh, the part of the working class not being able to formulate a, a way forward, and when it does, it does it for a very short period of time, and then something happens, and the, the, the whole thing. Uh, uh, ten sour and the situation in Britain now it's really bad and it's bad uh, as a picture from us from outside uh, as well who had uh, something to hope for and but I, I think that uh, uh, the last thing we need now is just another is another party and uh, we should uh, start thinking what what we can do because all these thousands and thousands of Labour Party members who disappointed are leaving. Uh, they, they, they cannot just be convinced to stay in the Labour Party and fight. They, they, they just had enough and they are going out. So, while on the one hand, I, I would uh, certainly uh, prefer everybody to stay in and I would fight for anybody who could stay in, stay in. Uh, at the same time, we cannot but we kind of stand there just looking and uh, seeing what's happening and seeing the, the grip that Starmer and his bunch have on the, on the party and at the moment. Uh, uh, just try to convince that uh, something will happen, and something will change and the split will come. That's not enough. I think we should, we should find a way to, uh, to, 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 to speak to all these people that are looking for a way out for the left. And speaking doesn't mean convincing them in our ideas, ideas necessar necessarily. I think one thing that we should do is try to, to, to create a forum for all these people to express idea, ideas, uh, develop, uh, hopefully in what, uh, in, our, in what we think should be the way forward, but doesn't matter if they develop independently their own ideas and their own uh, their own way forward. The essential thing is is to stop looking at each other in a in a, in a hostile way. Just find a way to uh, uh, to build links with all these people because things are going to uh, to start happening as has been already. Uh, as has been already um, mentioned, capitalism is in, in dire straits. It, it, it cannot go forward. It cannot do anything uh, for the for the people. So explosions will happen, not only in in Belarus or in uh, in whatever uh, countries of this sort of in Poland or etc. But Britain and the United States, we have seen all this. And it's going to, to get uh, 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 harsher and harsher, and we have, we have to see opportunities in that, as well as dangers. And uh, I think this is the time to 
really discuss and uh, and put ideas on how we go forward. One thing also I, uh, I should like to say, and we shouldn't we, we shouldn't just uh, uh, try to to solve big theory and how we are going to uh, to lead the revolution in the future, but just try to see what sort of policies a, a mainstream left party could put forward to answer the questions of today. This is not, this is not something that uh, is, is secondary. We have to be seen, we have to, uh, to give the, 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 the impression to, to, and to show that we are, we are in, in contact with the present situation. And it's from here that we start and go forward. We, of course, we have our theoretical future, but that's not the only thing we have. It's a way to go there that's, that is important. It's the old, uh, the old question of the transitional program, but it's, uh, it's not in the normal way that the Trotskyist sects have, have tried to put, it, uh, to put it forward. It's not something to lure the workers from today to the revolution. It's something to, uh, to make the workers think and ourselves think about the real policies that can be implemented today. Thank you. Thanks, Temos. That's, that's fantastic. Um, just looking at the list, we've got one, two, three, we've got seven hands up now. So, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask comrades to try and keep the remarks to about five minutes so we're not going to get it in the time. And I'm also going to prioritise one or two comrades. I know, I know I'm not going to take it in strict order. So can I ask Raquel to come in now, please? I think I'm, I'm, I'm mute now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so thank you for the invitation again. And with all of the discussion, I had a kind of deja vu when I started to make part in the movement in Brazil when I was in the university. And that time, uh, I, I was trying to talk about like my experience there because in that time, Lula was in uh, got the uh, the government it was in two thousand thirty and was a huge discussion because the coalition and I was um, in a group which was like fourth international and we were telling, we were not agreeing with the coalitions between the laborers and the right wings party. And was this discussion, we should leave the, the laborers or not leave the laborers. In that time, a group left, uh, the, was recent that time a big group left the labels and this discussion from this group was like ah the labels is not helping there is lots of um we, we do not agree with all of things happening and within my group was more the discussion that even the labels has all of the problem all of the issues and we, we are trying to do the discussions uh, between everybody in the group, in the, in, in the party, even that is like the majority is more central or more, lots of op op opportunistic people going to the, to the Labour's party in that time because got the power, Lula was in the power. So we were discussing even the issues, the workers still have lots of illusions in the lab in the labels because the labels was the only party which could help the workers in some way because the history and the experience and everything. So in today I, I look all of the consequence which happens in Brazil. I don't know if you if you have been following the politics in Brazil and it's very hard to see the consequence of the coligations between the laborers and the right wings, and then the people who left the laborers, and now is like a kind of the laborers have to to fight with the right right wings and even with the left wings, like in a kind of just putting elections and everything, and this open the open the area or the camp or the just 
the disputes in for the right wings and Bolsonaro got the power and everything is much, much worse in Latin America. So I'm not, uh, is, is, I'm not recently, the last five, five, six years, I'm not really within the movement, uh, uh, like active part of the movement, but still I remember uh, these discussions and I really rely on labels because I think it's, it's the history is very important. It's not, it's not one day you just like form a group outside and then the things happening. So I think because of this, all of those news groups formed leaving the la leaving labels around the world, they just, they just like end really quick because there is no history and there is no direction and, and it's really hard to, to see like in a short time. It's just my contribution, sorry. Thanks very much, Raquel, that's, that's brilliant. Um, right, Trish, can you go next, do you think? And then I'm going to call Nick in after that. Yeah, a couple of things. I think contributions have been really helpful because I feel very much like Carol and well done, Carol, as well as Roger. I feel like Carol, I feel like we're being strangled and it feels kind of quite hopeless because of the way we're being strangled. But then I listen to Finbar and I feel actually, yes, the fact that we exist within a party that has the gravitas that Raquel was talking about, the kind, it's it, the gravitas, the stuff that Roger tells me um, regularly and what I need to hear regularly because I get despondent, angry, and I want to break out and go, oh, that we can't do anything. We can't say anything. We can't respond. We're not allowed to speak. We've got a general secretary and, you know, Stasi types, you know, Sir Keith, as he's called on Twitter, Sir Keith, which makes me laugh. Um, but the fact is, he, this kind of control of our our movement within is really frustrating and it feels kind of hopeless so I'm really happy when I hear the bigger picture from you people and I recognize how important it is for us to keep that connection going because we would just disappear and dissipate into the ether but I will say and it's very upsetting to watch is there's thousands of people leaving not just six they are hemorrhaging out the door and they are hemorrhaging in a really sad way, it's re they're really angry. And John Ryman was saying, why did only 27% of people vote? Well, I don't know the answer for sure, but I will say lots of people didn't vote because they didn't see the point. They didn't understand the vote, would have been another reason. Arguing amongst the left about what, which, which six to go for, making it quite complicated, also, already complicated and then overcomplicated by different lists. And then people thinking, what's the point? It's Starmer. With, with the, the loss of Corbyn was the loss of hope. And Corbyn brought, he made mistakes and he continues to make mistakes, I don't doubt. But what he brought to us all was hope. And when hope goes, it's bloody hard. It's hard to engage. And I'm still engaged. But, you know, my family, my son left ages ago, my partner's about to leave probably. And I can't stop him because I've got no real answers. And I... And I find it quite difficult to help. I say to people, we must stay and fight. And they say, how? You're not even allowed to speak. You can't even put something in your CLP. You're not even allowed to talk about anti-Semitism and before you get expelled. And, it, and it, yeah, that's true. And my last point, and it's an important point, I really want to raise it, is I actually think that the, um, the uh, EHRC is bullying Pam. I think they've doxxed her. I think they've put her at risk. I think that they put her name all over the country and potentially internationally. The right wing, um, I would say the right wing movement that would also include perhaps very, um, you know, hyper Zionist movement would, would and could seek her out and, and be very, very, that could be really frightening. And I think it's really bloody awful that... Um, that we've got a what's called a government body of sorts that has been allowed to bully somebody, an individual. They've named two people in that, pretty much, Corbyn and Pam. And I think that we should be terrified that they picked, when that they've picked on one ordinary human being and they've said, let's just, just say her. 
let's say her. And I don't even think it's because, Pam, they've decided that was the only two they could find. The fact is, I've said stuff that you've said. Lots of us have said stuff that you've said. They picked you as one person. And they picked you as one person because they're reminding us all how we could be the one they pick. I think it was a very, very clever way of saying, do you want to be in this situation, guys? Keep your mouth shut. Get out of the party and keep your mouth shut. And I think a hell of a lot of people are keeping their mouth shut. And we all need to stand with Pam. And I would really like to see us all helping Pam fight this because I think Pam has to fight this, really has to fight this. I don't even think, Pam, you've got a choice because yeah. if you don't fight it, they're just going to pick the next person to frighten to death. And it's terrible that they've chosen... I mean, it's terrible that they do it to Corbyn, but then to pick just a member. I'm not saying you're just a member. I'm sorry, Pam, if I'm making you sound less important than you are, but you get my point, I hope. You know, you're, you're a really important person as, and comrade, of course, but they have just picked you and said, let's go with this woman called Pam Bromley and let's make an example of her. And then everybody in the Labour Party who is going to argue about this, they'll be frightened. They'll be the next example. This is bullying. This is out and out bullying by the state or an organization linked to the state and i think we need to take this very seriously i think this is really frightening behavior from the hrc i think it's really frightening behavior and i'm considering that the best way to fight it would be to go before we leave in january is to set it up to go to the european courts of human rights because the e european courts of human rights are great they're really good they've done some great work and i think european courts of human rights need to be looking at our faux made up idea of European sorry of human rights and I think European courts need to be looking at this I know they have no jurisdiction soon although we don't have to come out of the European convention when we leave Europe they are a separate endeavor I think we will slide out without ourselves noticing but we should be taking it really seriously and that's what I wanted to say sorry I went on a bit long <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, Frank, Frank. Thanks, Trish. I suppose I should just reply to that. I am taking some sort of legal action. Uh, Chris Williamson's team and his solicitors are helping me and he's put his um, legal funds at my disposal. So I will be fighting tooth and nail against it. I think the reason they've picked me up is because I'm a councillor, really. That's the only thing, a fairly unimportant council. But also, I want to apologise for anything. I mean, the Labour Party dragged me through investigations twice. And I won't back off and I won't apologise. The other thing, of course, is the two people that are named are getting on in years. I mean, I'm 66. Ken Livingston's 75. So they're, in actual fact, they're picking on two pensioners to bully, which is absolutely outrageous. But I think, I think the European Human Rights Court is, is a good thing to think about and be the next step uh, along the way. But thanks for that, Trish, and thanks for your support. And, you know, do, you know it's, it's everybody's fight, not just mine. Isn't it an injury, injury to one is an injury to all? So, so moving back to the agenda, I realise some of you have been waiting quite a while to speak, but I do want to let some people come in that don't are either are fairly new or haven't spoken before. I'm going to bring Nick in, and after that, I'm going to stop for a minute. If there's any questions anybody wants to ask that they want somebody else to answer, if they can just say so, not to make a contribution at that stage, but to ask some quick questions, and then I shall return to, to the list. Okay, go on, Nick. All right. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I mean, one thing, I think on the NEC election, people are sort of talking about the low turnout. Well, I think a reason for that is what the right wing of the party have always wanted. It is kind of like a, a passive, moderate membership. And a hell of a lot of those people joined up to support people like Keir Starmer and Jess Phillips, but I think they're the kind of people who probably won't think about voting in NEC elections, so I think that could be a possible reason for it. And I'm just making a point about um, the suspension of Corbyn. I think Keir Starmer got really, really lucky, because any kind of chance of an upsurge against that was kind of cut across by us moving back into lockdown at that weekend, so suddenly other things took over the news agenda, and I kind of personally saw a bit of dissipation of the of the mood that was building up. But I think more fundamentally as well, before the Equality and Human Rights Commission report was released, he was also under a bit of pressure. He was definitely being kind of outshone and outflanked by Andy Burnham, who was putting up a, a modicum of a fight, at least, in Manchester. There'd been a significant rebellion on the... Um, 
on the Chiz bill when people like Dan Card had finally had had enough of it and came off the front bench and put up some kind of real resistance on the overseas operations bill before that. So I think this is where he may have been losing the advantage a bit in, you know, trying to shift the party irrevocably to the right. You know, there was maybe there a little bit of a pushback, which has now just all been all been swept away by this. But I think for me, the way a kind of split in the coming period, the most likely way I can see it coming is the way the rules and regulations of the Labour Party are being redefined in the face of this assault by groups like the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism and what I call, you know, these sort of Zionist fundamentalist organisations is basically looking to squeeze out any kind of legitimate left-wing discourse within the Labour Party by drawing it all up under anti-Semitism. You hear the arguments coming in that anti-Semitic discourse goes all the way back to Marx and can fundamentally be found in what Marx said about Cable. I mean, it's a complete misrepresentation of Marx, but that's basically what's you know, gain some traction among these groups. So eventually they've put in these complaints again about people like Zara Sultana, Absama Begum, and so on and so forth. Soon Corbyn will be formally charged for some anti-Semitic offences or whatever, and they'll be saying anybody caught supporting Corbyn will be expelled. I think it's going to be at that point, really, when the test is going to come, and we're going to see whether more people are kind of frozen out of the party and form a more significant grouping that can then not formally leave but at least point out that it's been victimised and create the beginnings of some kind of real resistance to you know Starmer in Parliament and elsewhere and I think that coming on the back of you know the calamitous economic situation that we're going to face is for me the most likely way that the situation is going to move so I just wanted to put that out there really. Thanks very much Nick. Now I'm going to bring um John Ryman in next, but before we do, does anybody want to ask any quick questions or say anything quickly that perhaps won't take more than a minute? Who's not got I that? Have a question. That's, that's, uh, that's I mean, what I is... wanted to speak on, panel. Sorry? I have a question that I'd like to ask. Well, just hang on because you're next. Before John comes in, because he can start with that, can't he? Is there anybody else at all that wants to say anything or ask a question? Or And I don't mean the people have got their hands up already, I mean everybody else. No? No. Okay, John, over to you. So my question is um, what uh, Carol, Spedding, uh, Carol had said about uh, the low voter turnout uh, really caught my attention. Um, as far as what is the mood within the broader layers of the membership of the Labour Party. And Trish partially answered that but I would be really interested in hearing some more discussion on what is, what is the wider mood beyond just the, the left activists and so on. That's my question. Okay, thanks, John. Um, Peter Sinclair, you had your hand up a bit. Are you still here? Can anybody see Peter Sinclair? Has he disappeared? Peter Sinclair, do you want to come in now? Sorry, you have you had your hand up absolutely ages. You need to unmute yourself. Where's he gone? Peter, do you still want to say something or not? You need to you mute it. You need to unmute yourself. Dave, I think, can you, I haven't got control. Could you unmute Peter, please? He's not unmuted himself. Sorry, Pom, I've got a serious back problem. Right, um, okay, sorry I've about been, that. I've, I've been sitting so long, I have to come back into the living room. Yeah. Uh, to recover, so I, I, I do apologise, sorry. It's all right, I'm sorry to keep I, you waiting all this time. <laughs> no, I, I'll just pass if, uh, if you don't mind, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, yeah, fine, you go ahead now, yeah. No, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry you pass on it. Right, right, that's fine. Don't, don't worry. Am. Sorry about that. No, it's okay, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. John, John Ryan, was that all you wanted to say, or did you want to say a bit more? Because I kind of cut you off a bit. If not, then... Um... No, as I said, I just had a quick question to all ask. Right. 
That's fine, John. Thanks. We'll move back to that. Right. Um, I'm going to bring Ed Bober in now. Um, thank you, Pam. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, that um, we congratulated Roger for his excellent campaign. Um, Carol Taylor Spedding also conducted a very, very good campaign. She came to speak at my branch of the Labour Party in Morpeth. Roger was there as well made a very big difference to the political consciousness of the people with the, that were there. Um, Pam, uh, um, Car Carol is um, not afraid to say things as they really are, to stick her neck out and to raise socialist issues, even when it's an uncomfortable situation. Um, now, both, um, both uh, Trish, and Carol have mentioned that, you know, the mood is down, they're feeling a bit disheartened. How do we go forward from here? The class struggle does not go in a straight line. We sometimes take one step forward, two steps back. Um, the, the ground for our confidence is that the capitalist system can no longer serve to raise the living standards of the majority of the population in Britain, the USA, Belarus, practically every country in the world. Um, in the past, in the 19th century, they might have sent children down the mines, they might have neglected health and safety regulations, they might have made our great grandfathers and great grandmothers work for a 16 hour day, but they could justify their system because it developed productive forces progressively over the decades, even though capitalism went through booms and slumps, progressively productive forces, technology, machinery, science developed and with that, and the strength of the trade unions, the living standards of working class people were a little bit better each generation. And the capitalist class were able to justify their horrific rule over society, even the wars that they forced people to go into and so on, because their system was playing a progressive role. From about the middle of the 20th century, there were massive booms and that gave them an extra spurt. It was, it, that was combined, of course, with substantial reforms, which were won by the trade unions and the Labour Party. But from the beginning of this century, certainly from the 2008 financial crash, it's become absolutely abundantly clear that capitalism can't develop productive forces any longer. That, and that's why, incidentally, they are, I mean, it's a, sign, it's a sign of weakness on the part of the Starmer leadership that they have to accuse lifelong um, anti-racist campaigners like Jeremy Corbyn and Pam, that they have to accuse them of being anti-Semites. When Kinnock was expelling the left of the Labour Party, he was, expelling, he was at least being honest about why he was expelling them. He was, We're expelling you because you're selling Marxist newspapers. But they can't, they can't do that now because the, 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 the grounds for the policies that they claim to represent are crumbling. Look, look at President Macron in France. Only a few years ago, he was hailed as the glamour boy of the European left. He was going to rebuild the left and, you know, step into the footsteps that Tony Blair had uh, created. And within months of him becoming president, because the centre ground have no way of solving the problems, he became a laughing stock of the, the of the whole of French society with you know all kinds of protests, pe uh, you know pe people blocking roads, blocking roundabouts, workers on strike, and so on. It, I mean, it's, you know he's he, he's uh, uh, he's a president without any policy to take society forward, and that is the best scenario that could face Starmer, that he would become leader of the country 
and and then find himself unable to do anything. A, a more likely scenario, or quite a possible scenario, is that he would go the way Kinnock did. Kinnock, Kinnock, Kinnock lost two elections because he was so busy expelling the left from the Labour Party. The, 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 the grounds for our optimism are not to do with little maneuvers and whether one extra person won or didn't win in this Labour leadership election. The grounds for our, opt our fundamental optimism, uh, as Marx says in, in, in Das Kapital, every time the bourgeois delay the appearance of revolution, the conditions that are building up underneath the surface of society of revolutionary anger, of distrust of the ruling class, of, um, of, of determination to find a way of fighting back against exploitation, all that piles up. So every time they delay and hang on to power, it creates the conditions where an even bigger explosion of the working class will come at some point in the future. And there's no way forward for the, at the present juncture. There is no way forward. We've got, we've got a buffoon for a prime minister, just as the United States had a buffoon for a, uh, for a president. Um, and, and that represents the best they can do. Um, and uh, our movement, our movement will grow. But, uh, uh, I mean, yes, people at the moment, there's a whole load of people who joined the Labour Party because of Corbyn, because they thought, like, like the media portrayed, it's all down to an individual. Cor Corbyn is a passing phase in the growth of a revolutionary movement in Britain. Um, you know, there, there, there's, there's, there's probably 200,000 young people outside the Labour Party who've left in the last six months. And when a new movement begins, they'll suddenly remember why they joined the Labour Party for Corbyn. And whether that movement is a revival of the left inside the Labour Party or a new movement outside the Labour Party, it doesn't matter. They'll join it. They'll, they'll join it with... with with a better understanding that this is not simple. It's not just about having, and by the way, this is, this is to, to, um, to, to Themos, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn did have a load of um, policies like Labour's Green New Deal that would have created millions of jobs, building council houses, you know, a whole load of, of really practical policies that face day-to-day -day issues. But, but the next stage of the movement the more thinking members of the working class will understand that it's not just about a leader, not just about policies, it's also about a strategy, a means for taking on the horrific brutality of the ruling class. And that, of course, means really the beginning of the development of a revolutionary party, which is what is coming in Britain. And it's coming out of this current situation that we're entering. Thank you, Ed. Um, right, we've just, the only hands we've got, so we've got, I'm going to bring Johnny no, uh, sorry, John Dunning next, followed by Jimmy Kelly. Um, and we've no more hands up at the moment, so if you want to put your hand up to come in with another brief comment, that's okay. I'm planning to, Karel, do you want to sum up uh, before we finish? Yeah, I'll just have a few points to... to All right, will ten, 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 ten minutes be enough? Easily, yeah. Right, that's fine. Okay, right. Okay, go on, John Dunn. Yeah, I think you've got to realise that the Labour Party is not the Labour movement. The Labour movement, as it exists outside the advances, and I think that's where the foundations are a new party or a new movement perhaps are being built outside of Labour. Groups have been existing, I mean one they all grieve truth and justice, the blacklist campaign is now in the middle of a public inquiry, it's something they've achieved without any help from the Labour Party whatsoever. The Shrewsbury pickets have been campaigning for 48 years and have now got a judicial review and all this is happening all these movements these campaigns have carried on irrespective of the Labour Party and I think if anything happened that tied these movements together 
together with the community movements that are already there, then that's where a new a new movement going to come from. And as for the Labour Party, I've, I've, I've more or less finished with it. I'm still a member. I'm only a member because they tried to throw me out. And nobody, you know, I've been thrown out of better places than, than Labour <laughs> Well, what we've got is when you talk about the Labour Party, I think we have to qualify that. This mass membership, and John Ryman asked about why only 27% voted in the NEC elections. That's quite normal. I think there are only 30% or so voted under COVID. And, and for all the thousands that joined, I used to go to our constituency and it were 20-odd people, the same 20-odd, some of them very, very odd, I might add. But in, in the coalfield areas where I come from, the Labour Party's died years and decades ago. It exists by a few councillors and the families who just want to keep getting their seats. And if you look what Labour councils are doing, forget you know, are they all willfully implementing austerity and, and passing on Tory cuts? Some that I know very well, Barnsley, the height of the NUM militancy, the heart of the British coal field, the councillors there, led by another sir, I forget his name, is so memorable, they're digging up public parks in working... to the latest shiniest shopping centre that they're going to build in order for nobody in that area who's got any, who's, people have got no money to shop in. Rotherham Labour Council, as well as covering up all the child abuse that was going on many, many years ago, my own campaign, we have an annual All Grieve Rally because that's it. puts more obstacles in our way to try and prevent us holding things like that. It's unbelievable. And so we've got to accept, I think, that people don't really, in many former industrial areas, independents have been making inroads into all these. They lost control of bowls over way before Dennis Skinner lost his seat. My own constituency of North East Irish actually went Tory for the first time ever at the last election. People no longer identify in these areas. Genuine candidates who talked about the community, who, who organised on a socialist way, Labour had gradually be wiped out in uh, in these areas and, and you know and as for going along to Labour Party meetings you might want to pass resolutions but I've got better things to do with my time than sit through bloody minutes of the previous dog shit and things like that and then wait till any other business to move a resolution about Jeremy Corbyn that will then get ignored or, or whatever. My energies are in the movement. And they say the movement's alive and well. With you. And, and people who are staying and fighting all the time for you. But link up with those people outside. Some of the best people are leaving. They're not going to join some revolutionary organisation. They're not joining Tusk. They're not joining George Galloway's Workers' Party. They're keeping their communities alive. And that's the embryo, that's the foundation of where the new movement and the fight back will, will start. It won't happen in Labour. Thanks very much, John. Um, Jimmy. Okay, um, just by way of introduction, I'm a member of the British Labour Party, but I'm also a member of the Irish Labour Party and I live in Ireland and I'm an Irish citizen. Irish citizens have a right under a very old rule to join the British Labour Party and they took advantage of it and joined. Mm -hmm. 
I was allocated to a constituency known as Labour International. And Labour International has branches practically on every corner of the globe. The vast majority of them are people of British origin and British citizenship. But there are a few strays in there as well. Today, we had a meeting of the executive of Labour International, of which I'm very pleased to be a member. And with over 60, 63, 65, something like that, delegates present. And it was an excellent meeting, absolutely excellent meeting, because it was a meeting where people were having a very, very cautious and a very wary approach, because they were conscious of the fact that there is an attack on the party using bureaucratic means, using Stalinist means, being passed down through the personalities of uh, Keir Starmer and David Evans, the General Secretary. So people are aware, because some members of Labour International have been suspended and have been suspended for some time because they were left-wingers, and unfortunately because they got caught out. And the main way of catching people out in Labour International is because we all live on different parts of the globe, all our business is done openly, from executive right through to the branch level. It's all done openly on Zoom. So there's no hiding place. You can't have private meetings and you can't have uh, secret agreements. Everybody sees them. There's a conscious right wing in Labour International, mainly under the general title Labour Party Moderates. And these people have affiliations and relationships with personalities like Luke Akerst and promoted uh, the, the cause of the right wing in the NEC elections. Despite the fact that some of the more prominent people, some of the more public brassnick people were at the meeting today and probably recording the meetings to be used for evidence against us, a number of resolutions were passed. Some of them were critical of Evans. Some of them were critical of Starmer. Some of them were critical of the, abs of the attitude of those people. But some of them were uh, resolutions that weren't specific to a UK agenda. Uh, like, for example, there was a resolution passed on Palestine in relation to uh, asking Labour to recognise that the two-stage or two-state process in Palestine is now 72 years out of date and uh, Labour has to move on to develop new policies. The interesting thing was, despite the fact that there was um, a weight on the meeting by the fact that you knew that the enemy was looking over your shoulder, all the resolutions that were adopted were adopted by votes in excess of 45 against the rest. Three quarters of the meeting voted for socialist resolutions or anti-leadership resolutions, not, not personally slagging off Starmer or personally slagging off Evans, but slagging off, criticising and attempting to construct uh, a new way to work in the party while expressing the criticisms and also expressing an understanding that the general membership of Labour International will not be lying down under the threats that are sitting out there. Now, it wasn't a foolhardy meeting. People were cautious in the way they constructed their words. People were very careful that they didn't want to be uh, held to hostage, but they were absolutely determined, at least the majority were, absolutely determined to continue to fight on. Now, there's, the lesson I summed up out of it is, that this means that, as far as Labour International is concerned, the left is not defeated. And there is no justification in that situation to leave and go somewhere else. Now, one of the interesting things about the composition of Labour International is there's no middle-aged people in it. They're either old people or young people. The very, very few, the, the vast majority are pensioners, people who have been in and around the Labour movement for generations, and people who have been in and out from the Kinnock days. Some people go back uh, to active membership, back to uh, Gateskill and back even to, um, oh, shit, I can't, 
it's, it's a problem with your brain is you get tired and get old, you start losing things. But the thing about it is, these people and the young people who are coming through are determined to hold things together. And the, the one thing about it is that there would have been uh, a lot of people there who affiliation would have been to Labour Left Alliance, to the LLA. And there would have been a certain amount of disappointment that LLA sponsored candidates did not uh, succeed in the elections in the sense of getting elected. But there was a generosity and a well-being and a very deep pleasure and satisfaction that five other left-wingers uh, were elected and that the right wing only got four elected from the constituencies. And to me, like I, I, I left that meeting today very, very pleased, very satisfied, very uh, encouraged by uh, the fact that there was grumbling, the fact that there were moans, and if you were to read the lines on Facebook or that, that you might have drawn a mood. But from the people that were active, it was completely different. But there's one point I just want to try, and it might be helpful in relation to the question by John, in relation to the low vote. The low vote uh, is something that you would expect in a situation where, for example, in the Irish branch of Labour International, we have 160 approximately members registered, but there's only about 12 active. So the difference between the active members and the paper members, I'm sure, is paralleled right across the party. And it's not just the British Labour Party, the Irish Labour Party is the same, very small active membership and a lot of paid in members. So it, 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 I, I wouldn't be discouraged by that. I'd be more interested in what way the, the 12 people voted. But all in all, um, I would ask comrades to try and understand that what's going on in Labour International is good. And hopefully it's an indicator of what's there in the reserve of the rest of the Labour Party, and I'll just leave it at that. Thanks very much, Jimmy. Um, so we will have Jim next, uh, and then David Hebson, and I think that will probably bring us up to summing up time. Okay, Jim, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. <clears throat> um, fine. I, I very much welcome and, and like these wind discussions because uh, uh, I find them very full and frank, uh, uh, non-sectarian, and socialists can exchange their views, honestly, and their doubts. Now, normally when you say you have a full and frank discussion, it means you fundamentally disagree with everything that's been uh, said before, and that's not true. But I do have some differences with some of the possible hopes and optimism. Now, if it's not going to sound too depressing, uh, um, I found I agreed a lot with what John was just saying. I think the first duty you have is to speak it as you see it. And, and that's what I want to do. I'm very happy to be, be persuaded otherwise. Uh, um, and if I want to express the doubts I have with some of the points that have been, been raised. But just a, a back, well, what I feel basically is I've seen this movie before. Uh, uh, that's my overwhelming feeling. And just to give some background on myself is I've been a member of the Labour Party now for over 50 years. I worked six years full time for the Labour Party. I was a councillor for four years. I've held probably every single position going in a constituency Labour Party at some time over the others. My views have changed, developed, adjusted, but I think the socialist values are constant. A uh, um, strong supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. I knew Jeremy, we were fellow members of the same young socialist branch in North London in the early 1970s. He was a good comrade, a good friend. Uh, we would uh, uh, very much uh, go out a lot of times uh, together, meals around each other's places and so on. I don't think his fundamental values have changed, quite frankly. I think he's an honest, decent man. I don't think he tackled the anti-Semitism uh, controversy in the party decisively enough, but he now seems to be being persecuted for what he actually says as being inappropriate. Not necessarily it's wrong, but it's inappropriate. And I think in all the years I've been in the party, I've been criticized for what you do, but I'm not sure I've ever seen this about what you think. <laughs> that is quite extraordinary. 
where it seems to me a development now. And as I say, I think I've seen this movie before. Back in 1983, when you had a left-wing leader of Michael Foote and the party went down in electoral defeat, the left was blamed at that time for a suicide, longest suicide note in history, I think was the comment that was made about the manifesto of 1983. But people said at that time, it was a setback, but uh, wait, the big battalions have, of the labor movement have not been defeated. And everyone knew that the miners' strike would be absolutely decisive in 1984, 85, and it was. And the miners could and should have won, uh, but they were let down by others within the labor movement. It wasn't the end of labor disputes. There were other ones obviously of whopping, and then you saw the uh, poll tax uh, movement, which in the end brought down, brought down Thatcher. But overall, it took 32 years before the left was able to have a major role within the party again in 2015 after 1983. And I feel it's unraveling as before. Now, it can well be, as other comrades have said about the uh, issues of the budget, and obviously capitalism is nowhere near in as healthy a position as it was with the neoliberal uh, readjustment of capitalism after the implosion of Keynesian uh, economics in the 1970s. And I accept a lot of what Ed was saying there about the, that long-term uh, perspective and so on, on the party. But I'm not sure personally, and I'm getting on a bit now, uh, like John, I've got the energy to go through all the internal battles of the Labour Party over the next period, uh, uh, and so on. Because I don't know how long it's going to take, and I'm wondering whether or not I'd be better with my energies of involving myself in other campaigns and other issues. I'm not going to leave the Labour Party. I don't think any, there's any future in any kind of revolutionary purity, little tiny group or anything outside it, and I accept the perspectives that other comrades have given in terms of a long-term development. You need to link the issues together. You need a real socialist party. And that will come out of the struggles in the, uh, the coming periods. But uh, um, I think that uh, I, I will probably uh, uh, remain a member of the Labour Party, but probably devote a lot of my energies uh, elsewhere into other campaigns rather than in the internal battles of the Labour Party. So. Thanks very much for that, Jim. And finally, David Hemson. Uh, well, look, it's a, it's a marvellous discussion and it's all very first-hand because we know the people that are speaking are right there in the front line and, and, and fighting the uh, battles in the Labour Party and uh, more broadly in the Labour movement. I just want to make a few points about this struggle because of the international significance of the Labour Party and the British Labour Movement throughout <coughs> Africa, uh, in America and, and in Europe uh, too. Um, you know, my, my, my upbringing, um, even though it wasn't in a working class family, you know, was, was to, to Britain. I mean, there's a strong cultural and, and political link, you know, with Britain. And the developments to the left of Britain are very closely followed by people in South Africa, in the unions, in the uh, students and so forth. The rise of these shop steward movements in the 1960s created enormous excitement in South Africa and attracted us to the ideas of democratic development in the trade union movement and inspired us to organize the unorganized in South Africa and we've then resulted in a movement which is a movement of millions and some of the largest trade unions in, in, in Africa. So, you know, that is the way in which we orientated, we learned, and we interacted. Sometimes we wanted to swear the TUC <laughs> and, and the Labour Party for their lack of uh, solidarity, but they were our brothers and sisters we didn't always use the term comrades because sometimes they didn't really appear as comrades, but they were the people that we could look to and uh, could actually move mountains when when we we had to uh, when we moved in struggle. Now that's a beacon in 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 South Africa and and Africa 
and the enormous upsurge uh, of interest in the Labour Party and with uh, Corbyn standing and, and, and almost as an accidental factor, but it then became a real development uh, and the attraction of, of tens and then even hundreds of thousands of uh, members into the Labour Party, you know, really caught the imagination of youth interna you know, in, in internationally and raised our hopes, you know, high hopes for a change in the colonial bastion, well, let's say the imperialist bastion, and uh, throughout the former colonial world, in India and everywhere. Now we see that with the Labour Party leadership has in the past had catastrophic decisions, quite apart from the neoliberal program, which has led to the deindustrialization of, of Britain, which they, you know, not challenged. They've even had the ca catastrophic, you know, catastrophic decision to lead uh, Britain into the Iraq war and so forth. They've really pulverized the labor movement and caused, you know, a, a, a real reaction and disappointment. Corbyn raised the hopes high again, and we saw an, an enormous upsurge. Now, we, youth internationally, workers internationally, believe that another world was possible and the Labour Party would be part of <clears throat> the new world which is being constructed. Those are the hopes that are placed in this battle, which is sometimes a, a, a slugfest, a, a, a desperate battle here and there, complicated uh, suspensions, all kinds of rule changes and, and the like. Uh, and this is the international significance of what is taking place you know, in the Labour Party. So we stand firmly with the comrades that are fighting the fight inside the Labour Party. Congratulate Ro Roger on a marvelous uh, campaign. We realize that battles are far from over and that the Labour Party will eventually face a dimension where it has to decide, well, the members will have to decide whether to stay with this old leadership or whether to make a clean break and, and, and to take on, put on new clothes, whether, you know, a genuine Labour Party uh, of, of the working people. Um, but that false moves, early moves, which actually splits away the left and leave the leadership uh, in, in power in the Labour Party are not, are not what we uh, want to see, although we firmly understand you know, the reservations, the points that have been made by those that feel they cannot stand and, and, and waste the last years of their lives, you know, fighting rearguard action. At the same time, we know that there will be new upsurges and we were looking forward to seeing in Britain, as in America, as in South Africa, as in Zimbabwe, as in many other countries in India and elsewhere, an, an upsurge after, uh, during and after the COVID pandemic that we are experiencing and, uh, and the possibilities of reconstructing a labor movement from top to bottom and creating the prospects for socialism. Thank you. Thanks, David. I think that was a very eloquent uh, summing up of, uh, of the situation. Well done. And you've stuck to your time as well. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. So uh, I think well, without uh, further ado, I shall now return to Karel, who wants to make some final points. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, thank you. I think I've learned a lot this evening and um, from all of you hearing you speaking with your vast experience. Um, and it's been wonderful. Thank you. So I just want to respond. Jo John put a question about how are ordinary members feeling? I do want to answer that. Um, and I'm going to answer it by saying, as we always say, that there are two parties in the Labour Party, two parties in one party. So the right wing are really, really happy. And the left, on the whole, are quite despondent and disappointed. But I think there's um, a key number of people in that second group that are resolved to fight back. Um, and that is the position currently. I take on board everything that everybody said about the Labour Party, you know, that Starmer, Sakia has got a vast vice-like grip and the witch hunt is an unprecedented witch hunt. Um, but the Labour Party has lost many of its red wall seats in the north of England, the former industrialised areas, as John Dunn pointed out and others pointed, pointed out. But I just want to say something from um, 
being in the inner city areas of the East End of London. We're all not in the Red Wall, we're called in the Black Wall seats because we've got very large numbers of um, members of our community or who are of black, who are black or ethnic minority backgrounds. And it's very possible, I think, that Labour can lose some of those uh, areas where they vote Labour consistently and have never actually voted any, anywhere else. In my, in my constituency, West Ham, we have never ever elected anybody other than a Labour count candidate, ever. We have always had a Labour MP amongst the highest majority in the country. And in fact, East Ham, which is a neighbouring CLP, does have the highest majority in the country. And those majorities actually are falling slightly. Um, and it looks as though that that, will, that trend will continue. Now, there was a report that was published, I think, on Thursday, looking at Islamophobia in the Labour Party. 57% of those people who were asked, uh, Muslim people, members who were asked about Islamophobia, felt that uh, Islamophobia was widespread in the Labour Party and they had actually um, been a victim of it. So, you know, things are not good in the Labour Party on so many levels. So what is Keir Starmer up to? Well, apart from a lacklustre, um, you know, question time with the Prime Minister is a completely lacklustre performance. Um, so, so much for being a forensic QC. Um, it's lamentable, his performance. I mean, the latest thing from Labour, when you've got Brexit a month away, where you have, you know, record numbers of people getting COVID, getting sick, the health service not able to cope in many areas of the country, um, looking after the, the poor, the elderly, the ill. You know, what's he talked about? He's put up um, a thing about the Labour Party wants people who put up anti-vaxxing propaganda on social media for it to be taken down. So, I mean, you know, that, that's where we are in terms of priorities. There aren't any real certainties in the future, except that we know that the crisis is almost upon us. It feels like you're standing on a beach and that tsunami's on its way. There will be such a huge outpouring of anger. There will be explosions in society. You know, the thought of mass unemployment of... Um, our local council, which actually is 60 Labour councillors, 60, are going to cut hot meals for children in an area that has some of the highest levels of poverty in Europe, not just in Britain, but in Europe. That is a Labour council. Homelessness is rife here. And there are lots of charities and organisations trying to deal with it but it's the boy with the finger in the dike. Now there will be huge movements in response to those up, uh, as part of those upheavals. You know, it, Black Lives Matter, John Dunn mentioned the Blacklist campaign, the Orgreave campaign. We have had um, huge movements around Black Lives Matter against the privatization of schools in this area. So there will be actions in this society by the TUC. There are unprecedented level of battles ahead. And I've got absolutely no doubt about that. I've got doubts about other things, but that I'm fairly certain it will happen. And again, there won't be any false early moves out of the Labour Party, clinging a hold to some small sect with the hope of socialism around the corner. That's not the way it's going to be. What we're doing here is sticking inside, but orientating as we have always done to our class. We are rooted in our class, we are with our class, and we have it in our area 
and across the country to be seen to be rooted in the working class and to offer socialist solutions. You know, where are the leaders? Well, we are leaders. We're the, we are the people with the ideas and who can help other people to come to those conclusions that socialism is the answer to our problems. Thank you.